Saturday night. Welcome to the Jonathan Ross Show. Let's see who is in my green room tonight, shall we? He is boy band royalty and now an all-conquering solo artist, the one and only Gary Barlow, ladies and gentlemen. Evening, Gary. What a handsome girl you. I love Gary. We've also got star of Coronation Street and she was voted sexiest female at the Soap Awards this year, Michelle Keegan. <laughs> Almost as sexy as Gary. <laughs> He's been in some of the biggest and best loved films of recent years, including Shaun of the Dead, Mission Impossible 3 and 4, Star Trek, the brilliant Simon Pegg, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and like in the fact... <laughs> and... And I'm excited, I hope you are too, celebrating an incredible 55 years in show business. A true legend is among us, ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Dame Edna Everidge. <laughs> Dame Edna Everidge. Uh, we just had the first week of I'm a Celebrity. Are you watching I'm a Celebrity? Are you enjoying I'm a Celebrity? Yeah, I'm loving it. In particular, I'm loving Joey Essex, okay? He's the gift that keeps on giving, and he... First up, we had the revelation that Joey has never learned to tell the time, okay? I mean, he can do it on his phone, apparently, but not on a, a watch with all those confusing hands. And I think that probably explains his colour, because he was only supposed to be on that sunbed for five minutes, and he didn't know. <laughs> uh, and then Joey made up a new word in the jungle. Do you hear this? He came up with the word confrontate. <laughs> He's given us new words. That's impressive. He should go on countdown. Oh, no, actually, he shouldn't, because they've got a clock, haven't they? So he wouldn't... <laughs> I love Joey. We've also learned this week that he was never taught how to blow his nose properly. I mean, why would you say that out loud? I was never taught to blow my nose. And he said, he thinks there's a couple of ways to do it. He said, it's a regular way and it's a professional way. What's the professional way of blowing your nose? It's probably just as well, because he did one big blow, his brain would end up on his handkerchief. <laughs> Gary, you'd be good in the jungle. Have you been asked to do uh, I'm a Celebrity? Oh, many times. Uh, would you do it? Never. Well, you wouldn't be scared. You've sat next to Sharon Osbourne. You'd be fine. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, Dame Edna is, of course, ladies and gentlemen, our Australian guest this week. Uh, I don't know if you've been watching I'm a Celebrity. Does that give us a fair idea of what your fabulous country is like? Well, darling, it's a beautiful country, and we eat a lot of antidepressants in Australia. <laughs> <don't you? laughs> we hold the world's record. Really? I started it off. <laughs> <laughs> Look how happy I am! <laughs> OK, there was a great story this week, ladies and gentlemen, about a 19-year-old called Luke Harding. I don't know if you saw this. I love this story. He went out for a drink in Oldham. He woke up in Paris. <laughs> Here he is. There's the young fella, OK? <laughs> could be worse, of course. He could have started drinking in Paris and woke up in Oldham. That would really be... <laughs> but waking up in Paris, that's a big night out. Although we've all had big nights out there. Some people get so wasted, they wake up in the morning and they find they're the chairman of the co-op bank. That's how big a night out. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Dangerously close to satire, but not quite. OK, uh, so I get sent a lot of stuff in the post, and I opened one envelope last week in front of my wife, OK, and I didn't know, I get sent stuff and I don't even know what's in it. I opened this envelope up, and this is what was in it. That. <laughs> that camera. She's always had her doubts about me, that confirmed it. And then, of course, she realised it was calendar season. These are the rowers of the University of Warwick Boat Club. They sent me their calendar, and you can see it's a full crew there, although you can't see the cocks, I don't believe, but you can see... <laughs> Here's another shot from this calendar. Check this out. There you go. OK. Perfectly natural. Just five guys hanging around by the river naked. But my favourite picture, and I do have one, OK, is November. Look at this one. You'll work out why it's my favourite. <laughs> I do hope he's keeping that bucket up with his hand. Uh, let's get my first guest out. We first met him as one of the most successful boy band members in the world. Now, 50 million albums later, he's not only our favourite judge on X Factor, he's about to embark on the biggest tour of his solo career. It's Gary Barlow! <laughs> Show. Nice to be back. Well, you were on a few weeks ago. There you go. You've got a... Good evening. Good evening. A lot of love from the crowd there. Hey, because uh, last time you were on a few weeks ago, we had you on as part of the X Factor yes. Ensemble. And you've only got now, you've only got one act left in the X Factor. What are you trying to say? 
What's going there? What's happening? Will rough copy make it through to the end? You only need, you only need one good one. Rough copy, everyone. Do you think they're going to go the Great, distance? I hope so. I mean, you know, whatever I predict, I'm usually wrong. I get it wrong every year. But I think, you know, to me, they look like pop stars. That, you know, you'd give them a deal. They're, they're great. And, of course, you know what? Sometimes coming first isn't necessarily the best place to be in the X Factor. Yeah, and, and also the final's very unpredictable because I feel like people who don't vote throughout the series only vote in the final. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anything can happen. It's a big night. Hey, well, let, let's talk about you. You've had an what an incredible career you had because you were in the biggest boy band. That was a time when those kind of bands weren't around. Now we accept yeah. that if a band comes along and they're good, a boy band, it will happen. Back then it was a surprise, I think, really. I mean, <laughs> there we are. Lovely. Amazing. <laughs> When we came out, Stock Aitken and Wharton were coming to the end of their reign, so all the big pop acts had sort of, they'd declined, and so we, what we had in the charts was like dance music, faceless dance music. So when we come around, all the editors of the magazines like Smash It and Looking, they couldn't believe there was an act at last to put on the cover. Yeah. And so it was really attractive at that time. What we couldn't get, was, though, was a hit record. It took us four attempts to get a hit record. But you, you know, you, who, who would have thought there'd be such an accomplished uh, songwriter in that group? You, I guess, had faith in your talent. But, I mean, it was remarkable that you had that many hits and then you have continued and had a career afterwards. And it wasn't that smooth for you. I mean, there was that period in the middle when the band broke up. Yep. And everyone thought, OK, Gary's going to be the star. But it, what, you weren't the star, were you? Initially, it was Robbie. Oh, I, listen, totally. Rob, Rob took it and run with it, yeah. you know. I mean, we all had an opportunity of doing something at the end of Take That. You know, Rob took his opportunity and run. And there was a lot of expectation on me, and, and I couldn't live up to it. And at the time when I released my last solo record, which was, which was actually 14 years ago, that last album I made, it was a, a, quite a miserable time because I felt like it was a record made to please everybody. It was made by committee. I had Clive Davis in New York yeah. telling me the type of artist he wanted to me to be the label in London telling me the sort of artist they wanted to me, me to be and I look at the record and I think well who is this you know yeah, there's, yeah. there's hardly any of me on there it must have been very hard for you well when you were you left the band and you were and we all thought you'd have this big solo success and now but Robbie had the success mm -hmm. and there was a period where you well okay it's gonna sound wrong to say this you weren't a joke as such but you kind of were it was a bit it was like oh poor Gary yeah, it's, it is weird, but I think it's fascinating. I tell the story from the point where I want people to learn from it, not for sympathy, because at the end of the day, I've had a really, really great career in music. But it's amazing how quick it can change. I mean, literally within a couple of weeks, you lose your record deal. And I could count on one hand the people who kept in touch with me through that period. And because when you're hot, everybody wants yeah. to be with you're you. You're invited to everything. When you're, you're not, it's like you've got leprosy. Nobody wants anything to do with you. Yeah, I had a brief period like that. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> <laughs> but what's marvellous is you came through it stronger than ever. You really did. And this sounds like the kind of song lyric uh, right there. But you came out the other side. Uh, but I love, in a way, I'm fascinated by that period, purely because you were very honest about talking about that. You were very honest. And I know also, you know, just the kind of weird experiences. Because you were still really you know, unsophisticated perhaps is the word now you're pretty much you know you're well traveled and you're obviously a mature father now you've had hit records you've mentored other bands but i remember in the book you had at the time where you mentioned clive davis there the big yep. record mogul and you went to you had a meeting with him mm -hmm. and he offered you tea yeah. and you and you made it tell people what happened That's well he he was one of those characters that um that uh, Around him, I'd become nervous and just had this long list of things I'd do and, you know, I'd spill things and I'd knock his tea over. I, I mean, I've got this long list of things, but the worst one ever was, um, he invited me to his hotel one morning and he was on the phone when I, when I arrived. And, and so he ushered me into another room and he said, help yourself to some tea. And so um, there was no tea anywhere. I couldn't see anything labelled with tea. And, um, and I saw a plate with a silver lid on it. And I lifted the silver lid and it was scrambled eggs on toast. And it was, it, it was a really fine scrambled eggs on toast. The crusts were cut off, the chives were lightly sprinkled on it. It was beautiful. And I thought, you know, being northern tea, you know, dinner, lunch, tea. I think this is it. This is it. So I wolfed it. I mean, like, wolfed it. I had that... I had that jet lag hunger where I just wolfed it. I put the lid on. Ah, oh, this is great. And then he came in and he said, just sit over there while I eat my breakfast and lift the lid off. 
and I'd eaten the whole thing. And, and so th this, this sort of, this, this went on and on. Around him, I would make these terrible mistakes, and it wasn't a good relationship. Yeah, yeah, and that didn't really pan out for either of you, really, it really? It didn't work, oh, okay. no. Uh, the new album, Gary Hayes' his new album out right here, ladies and gentlemen. Since I saw you last, it's out on Monday, I believe. Yes. But there's a, a duet on it with Elton John. Yes. So I know you're, you're reasonably close with Elton. You know Elton fairly well. You know, I've known Elton for about 20 years yeah. now. And, um, yeah, we, we speak a lot. I see him two or three times a year. We've always kept in touch. This is face-to-face. -face. This is not the one that Gary will be doing later on. But have a look at this. This is two, two showbiz legends performing together. <laughs> Gary Barlow with Elton John there. You, um, didn't you try to get, uh, get in with Elton's company? Didn't you try and get signed up by them? Well, when I was 16, I used to go to London every three or four months with, with cassettes of music. Of and the songs you'd written, yeah? Yeah, I'd go into publishers and I'd meet people, and usually they'd play, like, one song and say, you know, it's not for us, but, keep, you know, continue the good work. Um, but I went into Rocket one day, which was Elton's publishing company, and I took my cassette in, and there were six songs on this cassette, and the guy put it put the cassette in and turned his back to me actually and he played through one song and then into the second I thought this is good into the third this is amazing he played all six songs I thought this is gonna be incredible and he, he got up after playing the last song and he took the tape out of the player opened the window and threw the cassette <laughs> said, do me a favour, don't come back to this office again. Wow. Yeah, that's a nasty piece of work. Yeah, and tell me about it. But you said Elton's a better man now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got well, hold it. Were there any songs on there, that, any of the songs that became hits? You know what, A Million Love Songs was on that. It was, it was track three. Wow. Yeah. Wouldn't you have liked to be walking under that window that day? <laughs> oh, I might do something with this. <laughs> hey, um, Gary, I saw, I didn't know you were doing this, and obviously it's something that a lot of planning, and I, I guess there, there needs to be uh, a lot of secrecy, but your, your trip to Afghanistan. Yeah. Yeah, it's been, a, it's been a long one, this. It's been two years in the plan in this, and it's literally been because of the MOD and the amount of secrecy behind Camp Bastion. I always wanted to take a show and entertain the troops, because at this time of the year, the new people arrive in Camp Bastion, they're there for six months, so they're there away from home for Christmas, and I've always wanted to take a show in. And I imagined a big variety show with comedians and musicians, and the MOD literally said, no, you can bring five people with you. And so we had to bring cameraman, sound man, you know, it was very, the, sh the list was extremely short. Um, and I had to do it between X Factor weekend, so I was literally there for about three days. And so what do you do? So you're performing out there, uh, and, and you used some of the talent that was actually there in the camp, didn't you? I only used the talent. Wow. Um, I didn't take any of my band with me. Um, and I put together a band of just the soldiers and we had an amazing day. I met them all first and so I went round to see them in their jobs and you know they're, they're really skilled, driven people and then in the evening I become the boss and we're rehearsing and playing music. It was fantastic, it really was. Uh, we have a clip of you there but it must have been, uh, I would have thought, uh, almost a surreal experience for you because you're doing this music but you're in the middle of, of a, a situation and in a location which is, your life is in danger as indeed is everyone's there. Yeah. Yeah, it was, um, to be honest, I didn't feel in danger at all in Camp Bastion. I felt a little bit in danger when we were landing um, because I think, you know, ob obviously army aircrafts, are their, their targets there and we all had to put our body armour on. But once I was there, I felt completely safe and the, the morale on the camp is amazing. Um, the gig was incredible and we did the gig over two nights because we thought, you know, if, if, if a storm happens, if, if there's a security alert and the gig gets cancelled, at least we've got a night to spare and that did happen on the first night there was a security alarm and there was a sandstorm all on one night and so we knew we only had one evening left but we, we did get it done and the concert was incredible wow it's a, this is a little clip from the show that Gary Mayboy was out there have a look at this you can really see the extremes of the uh, of the environment as Gary, as Gary Barlow journey to Afghanistan that's on ITV the night of the uh, the week after the X Factor final you think it's in a few weekends okay. time yeah uh, and so you did the how long did the how long was the gig when you performed uh, we ended up doing about an hour wow. in the end. I mean, it was great. The crowd were all singing. They were ho holding up messages for their families. It was just a really heartwarming moment. Wow. Um, take that aback. You're going to be recording some new material next isn't it? year. Is it, is it January? Uh, you've got that plan for? Uh, well, we're hoping it to be out this time next year. So okay. yeah, we'll start okay. as the new year starts. Have you have you started writing the uh, stuff for the boys yet? No, we'll start. Now. We'll start literally okay. in January. And yeah. do you know whether it'll be the five of you or the four of you? No, I don't know yet. I'm hoping for five, but we're going to all sit in Jan and decide. I mean, it's usually diaries and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I'm hoping to have Rob with us.
I never saw Take That Live. I never saw Take That Live back in the day. I've mm -hmm. seen them since now, and it's a very different show yep. uh, to the earlier days of the kind of choreographed routines and that kind of thing. Do you prefer it now where you don't have to do what people say, where people don't expect you to do that kind of act, or do, is there part of you that misses that? No, the funny thing is, definitely, we all like, we're not doing any routines on this tour, but what happens is we do like a retro section, and we all can't wait to start busting <laughs> the old moves, and we're like, yeah, we've still got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, you say you've still got it. I don't know whether you've got it to the extent you have it. I've got a clip now, which you won't have seen for a while, I think. And I, every time well, I because, come on your show... Because you, there's so many of them we need to get to. <laughs> this was you on an Irish show uh, many years ago. It was called The, uh, the Kelly Show. Belfast. Belfast yeah. in 1992. I don't even remember this, but this is the most extraordinary dance Really? Routine. Have a look at this. I call a routine. That is a smoking routine. But you must have known what you were doing at the end when Robbie bummed you. I mean, that must have been planned. That wasn't just accidental choreography right there. Let's have a look at that bit again. Just tell me that tiny kind of bit at the end. Okay, so here we go. You're that. Bob, look at that. I mean, come on. It's the face on Rob behind it. It's the smirk. <laughs> okay. That you, yeah, I think you invented twerking. <laughs> We did. Yeah, I think see, everything it. comes around. You're the blame. Um, ladies and gentlemen, he's going to be performing live for you at the end of the show, but I hope you enjoy spending time with his company, as I always do, the fabulous Mr. Gary Barlow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Okay, still to come, Dame Edna Everidge will be here, Coronation Street's Michelle Keegan, and the very funny Mr. Simon Pegg. So, join me after the break.